This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, a museum that houses a collection of thousands of iconic arms and armour from throughout history. On today's episode, he's going to be breaking down the guns of Cyberpunk 2077 to see what real-world weapons inspired the sci-fi creations in the game. The bit they've definitely taken is the, what's affectionately known as the HK Slap, like that. Let us know if there are any other games, guns and mechanics that you want to see on the show and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this, such as our recent Escape from Tarkov episode and if you want to support Jonathan's work at the Royal Armies Museum, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, time to hit the streets of Night City. Sovi, are you willing? Okay, I'm going to invoke the new catchphrase and pause. Just want to say about the pistol, it's a machine pistol, so it, or a fully automatic pistol, and it's kind of chugging along at a very, very slow rate of fire. A bolt of that size and mass, propelled by any kind of cartridge that propels a bullet worth a damn, is going to send that bolt flying back and forth at a much higher rate. So machine pistols like this are typically more than a thousand rounds per minute, and this thing's chugging along at, I don't know, three or four hundred. We've also got an interesting ejection pattern for the cartridge, empty cartridge cases. Uh, the ejection is going straight up. Now in a first person shooter, first person RPG type setting, that's quite distracting and detracts from your ability to aim. In real life, it's really not a problem. Things that eject vertically include the Luger pistol, which can land hot cartridge cases in your hair. And the Scorpion machine pistol slash submachine gun tends to eject violently straight up. So it's not unheard of. Interesting to me when um, things that happen in games are, that are a problem aren't actually a problem in real life. Uh, so I think um, perfectly serviceable near future handgun. It's maybe a bit big and bulky. In the current era, for, for guns to carry around, they're quite compact. This is more like a, this is bigger than like a service handgun. For, for an armed force. Just quickly on the sights, they, they're very conventional. They really look like current night sights. So they're, they're glowing so that you can pick them up in low light. But they're not doing anything particularly sci-fi. Uh, I imagine they're upgradable so that they are more sci-fi. Ladies and gentlemen, Jackie Wells. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. Right, we've got a new weapon to me anyway. It's, I believe it's a submachine gun in the game, but the the, Depth of the magazine, front to back, suggests that's probably an assault rifle or perhaps something like the P90 cartridge, which is quite long, to be fair. So, hey, the game says it's a submachine gun. Who am I to argue? It's a, a bullpup. So we've got the working parts behind the trigger. It's like an uber bullpup in that the magazine is attached right at the back of the receiver, uh, which at first glance has you scratching your head or thinking that's impossible. It's actually not impossible. Um, there is one firearm and one firearm only that I know of that resembles this configuration, which is the TKB-022, which is a, a Russian prototype bullpup. And it has the magazine right at the back of the gun as well. Now that's because it's got a vertically sliding breech block. So the bolt goes up and down to feed rounds uh, into the chamber. Now, I don't know if the developers got us so far as to think how the action of the gun works and, and whether what they've designed makes any logical sense. No reason why they would have to do that. It's fiction after all, but technically a very interesting design. So in, in this, it's a bullpup and it has a trigger shaped cocking handle on the top and a sort of carrying handle on the top. It does resemble our old friend, the FAMAS. Here is the FAMAS. Uh, a product of the 1970s, as we have explained in previous videos. So this this was always a very sci-fi looking gun. So it, I dare say there is some inspiration with this weapon. For people who aren't intimately familiar with firearms, um, you could stick this in a game as is in an inner science fiction shooter. And a lot of people would assume it was a gun from the future, I think. But then I am getting old. All right, I just want to pause there to say this thing is pretty cool. So what we've got here is, as you can tell, and people already playing it will already know, is a apparently 12 gauge shotgun, but it's using electromagnetic technology to accelerate whatever it's shooting. And I imagine there's a choice of 
sort of buckshot slug, different different ammunition. That's what it appears to be anyway. So an, a, a rail gun shotgun, effectively. The the aesthetic of it is almost like the super shotgun and the BFG <laughs> from Doom kind of smashed together, which I very much enjoy. But then when we open it up, we've got a conventional top brake lever and we've got conventional looking brass or copper case heads there. The charging up effect fits that meme of the double barrel shotgun as a devastating close range weapon. Uh, now I knew this was coming, so I've grabbed a gun uh, to show you. I've gone for what I think we would probably call a howder pistol. Two triggers for the two hammers, so it's mechanically very simple. So an, an old, an old idea. This would be a very serviceable close combat weapon, just as we see on screen. Major difference, I suppose, is this saw handle. It allows uh, recoil control because something like this, especially if you're going to try and pull two triggers at the same time, which you can do with this, means a lot of recoil, which tends to tip up. So this stops the gun from pivoting upwards and out of your hand, perhaps. Yeah, so a, a really interesting historic firearm that I just thought um, people might want to see. Pause. Right, um, so I was confused by the submachine gun that looked more like an assault rifle. And now we have an assault rifle that looks more like a submachine gun. This though, this is like a vector mashed up with a Galil, um, the, the Israeli Galil family of rifles. That, that handguard with the, um, the big hand stop at the rear is reminiscent of the, uh, the one on the ACE and actually on a couple of the earlier variants. Now, as a museum, we don't always have the latest versions of things. So we don't have the ACE. Uh, we have a couple of the other short Galils. So this is um, compact Galil, not, not the ACE, as I say. Um, I've also grabbed it because, as well as having some of the styling cues referenced in this design, because it's got this um, knuckle bow trigger guard. That always makes things look more sci-fi. Some, some of the guns are clearly meant to use a lot of um, polymer in their design. This is quite quite an 80s looking gun. We've got a what appears to be a stamped steel receiver, which is very much 60s, 70s, 80s technology. But we have some very futuristic curves and um, greeblies on there that make it look more sci-fi. We've got another handgun, a revolving pistol, as they might have said in the 19th century. And it is interesting that revolvers never seem to go away entirely. They go out of, they've gone out of fashion, largely because of the low capacity. That's always offset in pop culture by, you only get five or six shots, but those shots are more powerful because you can fit a bigger cartridge in the gun. The gun can take the explosion that's happening inside without flying apart. So does a revolver make sense? As much sense as, as a lot of things, in the game do. It's um, it's fiction after all. What I, I like the design. It's got the alien style round counter by the look of it. It's got more what I was expecting for future sights. Equivalent of iron sights, but they appear to be projected uh, or are on a very uh, slim bit of um, screen or something. But then you've got a, like a crosshair reticle floats in midair above your gun. That's what you want. That's where we will be going. I managed to miss there how this thing is actually reloading and it's a bit wacky. We've got a version here of the top brake design, which goes back to the 19th century. We've moved away from that in, in revolver design because it makes the gun weaker. It's breaking the frame open to allow the empty cylinder to come out and another one to be pushed in. And then you have to slap the top of the gun down almost like the top cover on a machine gun. Very inefficient and slow. Good for gameplay balance because it means your gun takes longer to reload and you only get your limited number of shots. But uh, it doesn't make much sense as a, as a viable design. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Obviously a futuristic assault rifle. It's it's a bit of a mashup of different features. So it has a it has one very obvious feature that we'll deal with right away. This is an AKM. And the, the rough curvature and configuration of the magazine is clearly inspired by the AK and its derivatives. 
But obviously, this isn't. This is by no means a futuristic OK that we have in front of us. At the rear, we've got features very reminiscent of a modern AR-15. Uh, and just a, a few sort of extrapolated features from different designs. I think the the handguard, front handguard, almost looks a little bit SA-80. And I know that the original uh, pen and paper game had as one of its futur futuristic weapons just an SA-80 with a different name. So maybe that's a, a callback to the old school game. The sort of the bulk of the of the gun being sort of front heavy gives it quite a distinctive look. Now, whether whether the back of the gun actually has enough space for a firing mechanism to to work within is a little unclear. It looks a little bit stubby at the back. Most of that seems to be stock, but um, don't know. It's the future. Don't know how these things work yet. What we also see is the uh, reloading technique, where you take a fresh magazine and you you slap the magazine catch push out the empty and then rock in your, your new magazine. The, the reason that technique was developed is because that magazine system is quite slow to reload. Very secure, you know when the magazine's on the gun, it's not gonna drop out, but it's, it doesn't beat pressing a button to drop the magazine out and having another one ready to push in. So it's surprising that a future weapon would use this arguably antiquated system. Another submachine gun, quite an unusual looking design from the first person view, but I can see from the, um, the HUD what it's taking its inspiration from, or at least partly. Looking rather a lot like sci-fied up UMP, Hecker and Koch UMP. Um, so resembling the, the weapon, the bit they've definitely taken is the, what's affectionately known as the HK slap. So with the, uh, the bolt locked open in this position, pretty much as, well, as we see here, and we see not, not the open hand, slap the cocking handle, but Neo's um, closed fist approach from the Matrix, like that, which looks cool and does the job. The, that HK slap is actually in the manual for the MP5. There's a lot of a debate over whether you should or shouldn't do it. The German, German armed forces trained that you should not do it, but H and K themselves say that you should. Speaking of style points, we have we have what's now become known as the wick flick. So we, we press the magazine release, which you can't really do with the real UMP because it doesn't have a button, it has a paddle. And then we flick the gun off to the right and the magazine goes flying out. You've seen it in the movies. And then you bring it back to the other side to put the next magazine in. In theory, it's to, if, if in case a magazine sticks in the gun and prevents you very rapidly reloading, you flick the gun. Often done for style points, I suspect. We're on to uh, something that I've just seen is called the Crusher. Why not? It's a shotgun. It needs a silly macho name. This is like, uh, this is reminiscent of some real world riot or close quarters combat or even door breaching shotguns that are super short. The design of the receiver is typical of a, of a modern self-loading shotgun, or some of them anyway. anyway. We've got a cocking handle on the left hand side, we've got a big chunky polymer magazine that's yellow, which normally would denote some sort of less lethal thing. The famously yellow less lethal gun is the, is the Taser shotgun, which um, we don't see anymore. It's quite hard to dress up a shotgun to make it look sci-fi. So I think they've done a, a good job here. Uh, let's see how it works. Oh, I'm going to have to pause there. Good grief. Uh, we've just seen. And I think in, in popular culture, this is why partly why shotguns are a thing more than they are in the real world. So, fighting people with. We have this perception that they will take off a limb, which is what we just saw there. In reality, the reality is both uh, less horrific and more horrific than that, in that uh, you cannot cleanly sever a limb with a firearm. It will, it will do horrific damage to human tissue that we won't go into, but it would not work as we see there. I'll pause there. <laughs> We've got here the idea of the smart bullet. Uh, it's a guided projectile. This is something that doesn't exist in use, but um, about 10 years ago, uh, DARPA in America did produce a steerable 50 caliber bullet, which had inflatable rings on it in order to change air resistance and turn the bullet. We've of course seen this in various science fiction properties as well. Hit your target, you fire over cover, and the projectile steers itself to the target. I don't know if that will ever become a reality for 
combat infantry, it's not too far a leap to suggest that a steerable under barrel missile, there is, there is in fact a, a prototype out there of exactly that. Now that hasn't gone anywhere yet, but that doesn't mean that it won't in the future. The, the computer uh, tracking systems now are sophisticated enough already to track a moving target. So we're already somewhat on the way to this type of technology, but it's a way off in the way that it's depicted here. But it uh, really adds to gameplay opportunities, of course, when you can hide behind cover and shoot someone behind cover as well, perhaps. That might have been the cherry on top. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, this has been a lot of fun. If you'd like to make a donation to the museum so that we can carry on doing this collaboration and caring for the collection that we have here. It's not expected in any way, uh, but some people have responded already and we're really grateful for that. Especially the chap who said he'd like to buy me a beer. We'll take the donation instead. Um, that's great, thank you. Um, if you'd even like to consider becoming a member, there's a link for that in the description as well. So have a look at those. Um, but it, you know, either way, um, thanks again for watching. We really appreciate it.